memory of rainy afternoons, swingy Harlem tunes, motor trips and burning lips and burning toast and prunes. How lovely it was. Thanks for the memory of candlelight and wine, castles on the run. The Okay, Barbara, cut it. Yeah. Our last speaker will be giving two, two presentations today. We have a special guest. Uh, we have uh, Thomas Weiss, and he's going to give a uh, talk on hoarding. This is going to be a very good talk. I hate to cut you up and put you, put you on the mantle right now, but this is going to be a great talk and I'm looking, looking uh, really forward to it. So please uh, help me welcome uh, Dr. Thomas Weiss. Well, well how do you, you party <laughs> survivors, 3 p.m. According to our circadian rhythms, this is nap time. So God bless you. And uh, I've got back-to-backs, but I promise I uh, will get you out on time or earlier. There you go. So um, my introduction is, is very short and simple. I'm a geriatric psychiatrist, although I'm only 63. And I'm a really <laughs> lucky guy. I have a half-time private practice just down the street, and I have a half-time research practice for 15 odd years now, mostly in dementia trials, but kind of all comers. So I'm just a lucky guy. So it's wonderful to be here. Um, I was asked to, to develop this talk a few years ago by the good folks that are up on the board here, Morningside Ministries. And just a little plug for them, and maybe an add-on for the Audie Murphy VA. What they've done, it's very clever. They've, they've, they've developed a free 24-7 online video library of topics in geriatrics and gerontology, from the ridiculous to the sublime. And uh, they're, they're all there at your disposal, 24-7. Just hit M&M Learn, and away you go. Dial it in for whatever topic you wish, a real brilliant idea, and then it continues to accumulate. So long story short, they asked me to give a talk on hoarding, and I said, sure, and I didn't know a thing about it. And, and my wife, ever the comic, ever the comic, she said, well, why don't you just show them your car? Or, or, or maybe your desk, or, or perhaps the garage, and that would just suffice. So she's, she's just ever the comic. But, uh, you know, I should, should know some of this as a geriatric psychiatrist. We read about it in the paper, but it was just a great learning experience. But, but before I launch, you know, I was here last year and I explained to everybody I was trained by Jesuit priests, and they insist that when you do a presentation, you have to tell a story or two, and you've got to introduce pieces of history, or you get hit by a Jesuit lightning bolt. So we'll do the, We'll do the story first, and, and I promise it'll tie into to hoarding. See, you heard about the nun who had to go to a conference in Chicago. She landed at O'Hare Airport. She hails a taxi. The, the cab driver picks her up, and they're driving along. And the cab driver keeps staring at her and staring at her and staring at her. And finally, the sister says, young man, may I ask why you keep staring at me? And he says, well, sister, please forgive me, but I've had this lifelong obsession with nuns. <laughs> And uh, I wonder if I might ask you an extremely personal question. And Sister says, so go ahead, you can ask me anything you like. And he said, well, Sister, is there any chance I could ever kiss a nun? And she strokes her chin and she says, well, there's a possibility, but you have to fulfill two conditions. The first condition is you have to be Catholic. And the second condition is you have to be single. The cab driver gets a big grin on his face. He says, Sister, I am Catholic, I am single. She says, pull over in that alley right now. And she fulfills his lifelong obsession. So they get back on the road, and the time passes, and the cab driver starts shaking. He bursts into tears. He's sweating. He's just agitated. 
And he says, Sister, I, I gotta confess to you. I, I'm not Catholic and I'm not single. I'm, I'm, I'm Jewish and, and I'm married. And the sister says to him, she says, that's okay. My name's Jack and I'm going to a Halloween party. <laughs> So you say, well, what could this possibly have to do with boredom? And, and my, my very weak bridge is because, you know, we don't even suspect it, do we, until it, it lands upon us and then we're all horrified and shocked, you know? For all you know, that person next to you that's extremely private and uh, very guarded, perhaps one day you'll enter their house or pass by it and voila, there's the surprise. So things aren't what they assume to be in mental health, are they? So with that little preamble, we'll kind of launch, all right? So you'll notice this has an odd subtitle, Diogenes Syndrome. And this bothered me when I began to, to get trained up and do my homework, because the only thing I know about Diogenes is he was this Greek philosopher who supposedly roamed the earth with a lantern, and as I understood it, he was looking for the one single honest human being on the planet. So how can Diogenes syndrome be attached to hoarding? So well, let's, let's find out. Let's kind of do the, the deal here. So first off, you know, I was taught by the Jesuits, you got to grab them right at the beginning, right? So we'll start with a, you know, a headline from the Daily Mail. That's a British newspaper. It's kind of sensational. And, you know, here's one sentence, and it says it all. It says it all. Loner, think about that one, let it resonate, dies buried under self-made trash tunnels. So there's a lot of ways I don't want to leave this earth, but that's one of them. I don't want to leave it this way, okay? But wait, we're going to, we want to, this is going to be like a Baptist revival. We're going to take you way, way down and then we'll resurrect you. <laughs> so, you know, depending on your point of view, you might say this is a very well-stocked refrigerator. <laughs> but then you have to look at the things like the expiration dates, don't you? Okay. And then depending on your point of view, you might say, how lovely. I actually counted how many cats are here. There's 78. You might say, wow, there's a genuine cat love. <laughs> but you know, you look at this picture, and what does not compute here? How neat and clean yeah. it is. Yeah. Doesn't compute. So now we're going to take a little step down that horrid path, and you might say, what's this got to do with hoarding? And I'll just say, stay tuned, stay with me. <laughs> and then this one, how long ago did you have lunch? <laughs> How long ago did you have lunch? Long enough, apparently. Okay. We'll move by that one, although that will resonate tonight in your dreams. And this is maybe a little more like a hoarder of cats because it's not very hygienic, but I don't think it's quite enough, all right? Because what might we suspect here? Infestations, an unbelievable smell, feces and urine abounding, okay? So right away, you're getting kind of a palpable, visceral feeling for this topic, aren't you? Hoarding. So, you know, I was trained, I always do outlines. I'm a very predictable, ask my wife, boring guy, okay, buy the book kind of guy. So this is our plan, but we're going to zoom through it, because I made you a promise. I'm going to talk about a couple cases right quick, kind of illuminate things, you know, give us a picture. Picture has a thousand words, right? Got to do a definition. If we don't have a definition, we're floundering. Do some history. I'm a history buff, plus the Jesuit, lightning bolt. Epidemiology, differential diagnosis, treatment, very vexing. I need your help here. And then we'll wrap it up with some conclusions. So that's the plan. So here we go. So case study. Forgive me if I read it in part to you. So here's a... Mrs. Flabeats, she's quite elderly. God bless her. 96 years young. Horrific vision, which always makes me say what other senses are going, like her hearing, maybe her taste. 
okay? And probably her sense of balance. But she lives alone, so right away you're immediately thinking widower, divorced, maybe never married, with dozens of cats, dogs, and parrots. In addition, some dead cats are found in the freezer. So right away you now shift to maybe there's something delusional or bizarre or psychotic going on here. And the house is god-awful. That was my mother's favorite expression when I was growing up. Just god-awful. It's filthy, beyond filthy. It's got a terrible smell. And I love this, this sentence. I mean, I'm thinking, are you kidding me? This is an understatement of the year. Evaluation revealed Mrs. Flabeats suffered from isolation, significant depression, and moderate memory loss. Now, here's where I want you to latch on. Over time, over time, an intervention plan was developed, and Mrs. Flabeats agreed to have her house professionally cleaned, and in keeping with the city ordinance, she kept only eight animals. What's the city ordinance for San Antonio? Four. <coughs> right. What is it? Already? It's six. 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 How do I know? We got three dogs and two cats. We're just <laughs> cruising there. Right? Now this is a lovely, this is the Walt Disney vignette. This is lovely. Okay? Because there was an intervention and it was planned and it was gentle. And it went well. And good things happened. So now we'll go over to Mr. Flabeats. He's a bit younger, 82. He's widowed. We don't know how long. Maybe there's complicated or prolonged bereavement going on. And he's living in a friend's house, so right away our curiosity is aroused. Why is he at a friend's house? And he begins to collect and hoard tools, parts, equipment, gizmos, toys of men. And as time passes, things get compressed and constricted because there's so much stuff. And the family calls the police. That's kind of curious. Maybe they've exhausted their entreaties. And suddenly, we've got too many cooks ruining the broth, don't we? Lots of helping hands. Everybody's jockeying for the pole position. But there's no collaboration. There's no gentle, careful, smooth, fluent plan. It's a, you know, it's a rule by committee. And uh, the family suddenly gets control, and they order dumpsters, and they throw everything away. Did somebody say off? Oh. I did. Yeah, off. Oh, right. Why? Because we've invaded this guy. Yeah. You devalued everything that he was important to him without So, so what happens to him? He becomes yeah. furious, rageful, and more delusional. And what's going to happen on round two? We got a fight in our hands. So we got Walt Disney story and not so good outcome. But contained within these two vignettes is an idea or two that I want you thinking about. Because maybe, you know, I know we've got, this is like a boy girl eighth grade dance. We've got psychology here, nursing here, social work over there, I don't know. But in your careers, perhaps you'll run across, or maybe you already have run across, people with Diogenes syndrome and hoarding disorder, you know. What, it's not just what's to be done, but how we do it. The devil's always in the details. Okay, so definition. Hoarding. It's the excessive. Now you might say, how do you define excessive? Collection. My wife says I'm a hoarder. I say I'm a collector. <laughs> and retention of things or animals until they interfere with day-to-day -day functioning, either at home, in your physical or emotional, mental health, with your family, your work, your social life. And isn't that the sine qua non of every disease, that the symptoms cause impairment socially or functional, occupation? Mm -hmm. And then if we really push it, these become public, per private, personal, and then public health hazards, safety, combustibles, mm -hmm. fire, rats, mm -hmm. infestations, rodents, mm -hmm. insects. Now, what's collecting? It's an organized activity. And it's on display for others to admire and appreciate. I had the pleasure to go to the Sistine Chapel this summer. Holy cow. They have 1,000 rooms at the Vatican. And every room is just full. 
top to bottom, floor to ceiling, with these magnificent artworks. It's too much to take in for a guy like me. <laughs> so, Diogenes syndrome, further definition. This is a behavioral disorder of the elderly, and say the young or the middle ages. It's got five components. I call it the four S's and the one nine S, okay? And the five components, and you're gonna hear me say this probably six times because I wanna cause a subliminal advertisement tonight. So number one is extreme self-neglect, hence the toenail, the disgusting toenail. Number two is domestic <laughs> squalor. The only time I ever use the word squall is when I give this presentation, but I love that word. It even sounds horrific, squall. Okay. Social withdrawal slash refusal of help slash no insight. Okay. Lack of shame at the situation. Indifference, if you will, but that's too mild. And then if you leave with nothing else this afternoon, you can use this at your next cocktail party. A new word, salajomania, which is defined as love of hoarding excessively. Now this Diogenes syndrome had other names, as you can read. I personally like the last one because it's the simplest, messy house syndrome, although you might say that has a very broad brush application. Okay. So there is. There's the four S's and, and uh, the one non-S, self-neglect, squalor, social withdrawal, shame, lack of shame, and hoarding rubbish, 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 non-useful items. So you think about those, that kind of symptom picture, and you know, I know we're all trained in different disciplines, but our disciplines often converge on what is the diagnosis? Because at the end of the day, physicians, psychologists, nurses, social workers, OT, PT, we have to make a diagnosis of some sort. We have to put a label, because label then directs us to treatment. So you think about these symptoms, and lots of things come to mind. Broad differential diagnosis. So what happens when we're depressed? We lose energy. We lose interest. So the care that we might take starts to tumble away and dissolve. Maybe we also slow down cognitively so we don't stay up with things. What about dementia? Well, we know a lot about dementia. You know, this is a disease not just of memory loss, but of behavior, you know, progressive decline and loss of activities of daily living, keeping things straight and clean. A great <coughs> symptom embedded in dementia is apathy. And a little sidebar there, frontal lobe syndrome. What happens when our frontal lobes are damaged? We lose judgment. And we do very inappropriate things. We do things that don't make any sense. Substance abuse. What happens when people are, are deeply in the grasp of horrific substance dependency? The only thing they care about 24-7 is securing, using, and then resecuring that substance, and everything else fades away. And I love the campaign in Montana eight years ago. You drive along the beautiful highway, beautiful vista, you'd see this huge billboard. It had a picture of a patient, methamphetamine addict, 25-year-old woman, no teeth, skin is shot, cachectically thin. She looks like a walking zombie. And it would just say three words, not even once. Okay? So there's substance dependency. It just destroys your ability to kind of keep straight. Right? Obsessive compulsive disorder, what do we know about that? Intrusive thoughts, unwanted thoughts, my hands are contaminated, compulsive behavior. I have to do this behavior over and over and over again and I can't stop not doing it. So what's the compulsion here? I can't discard anything. It's all valuable, it's all sentimental, it's all important, even the ads from the newspaper. And what about personality disorders? So these are kind of cluster A, you know, the odd, uh, the schizoid, the avoidant, the paranoid. What about a paranoid psychosis? If I throw this away, somebody will have information on me. A delusional disorder, you know there's seven types of delusional disorders, okay? 
And then lastly, I know I'm using a very dated term, please forgive me, but you know, folks that are intellectually challenged or disabled, okay, they may have maybe part of this differential. This is just a differential diagnosis about Diogenes syndrome, those five symptom domains. So I'm ashamed to say that because I'm 63, I'm going kicking and screaming into DSM-5. So this slide is dated. And what it tells us is that DSM-4, ah, yes, great wizard of Oz. I will do whatever you say at this point in time. Um, so when I developed this slide deck, it was still good old DSM-4. And this diagnosis did not exist. But I'm happy to tell you that in DSM-5, a disorder called HD, hoarding disorder, does exist. Meaning what? We can code for it. For those mercenaries out there, you can bill for it. But most importantly, now that we got a diagnosis, APS, Adult Protective Services, as a platform perhaps to manage it. Because in the past, what we did in Diogenes Syndrome is we just kind of subcategorized it under dementia. And this is where we blow the whistle, we fire up the flare, because a case of Diogenes Syndrome has been discovered, unearthed, sniffed out, if you will, and we think there is um, you know, either self-neglect or perhaps caregiver neglect. So, Diogenes Syndrome, very recent in the literature, described by our wonderful quiet neighbors to the north, Canadians. And looky when they described it, not all that long ago, 1966. And they looked at 72 folks, 60 to 92, and all of them were in squalor. All of them were rejecting help and society at large. All of them said, no problemos, all is well. And none of them wanted any help. And when they were able to finally gather some rapport, it took a long, long time. And they're able to do some diagnostics. Look at bullet number four. 50% had a psychiatric disorder. Well, you might say, ah, darn tootin'. And look at bullet number five. 50% did not. They did not have a frank axis one or axis two disorder. How stunning. How startling. How can this be? But wait, there's more. This is like an infomercial. <laughs> so another series, 13 years later, again, to our friendly neighbors up north in Canada. And lo and behold, it's a bigger series, but it, it replicates it across the board, okay? Look at bullet number four. But there's a little ominous piece. They follow these people for a long time. And they notice that if they follow them, and these folks go into hospital for whatever reason, Half of them die. So there's kind of a mortality piece attached to these folks. So they bear watching, don't they? Because they're at higher risk. They're more vulnerable. So why Diogenes? So we're going to take a little, a little philosophical, <coughs> historical left-hand turn. So Diogenes of Sinope. I had to look up, what, what is Sinope? It's what's now Turkey. Okay? But he's you know, claim to be a Greek philosopher. They're neighbors. They don't like each other at all. And he lived a long time. Look at his lifespan. It's pretty amazing in the fourth century BC to live that long. It's impressive. Must have been doing something right. So Diogenes was just an irascible curmudgeon, to say the least. He was the first cynic. You say, oh, I know cynics. They're not, they're negative people. They kind of scorn everything. And they don't look, up, look at it in the right way. If you look at what cynicism is in philosophy, it's far from that. It's the opposite of that. Cynics scorn luxury, and they scorn corruption, and they scorn insincerity. But that's what they scorn. Okay? So he was the ultimate minimalist. He scorned possessions. Okay? And look at his precepts, the way he lived. I mean... I kind of like a lot of those things, like self-sufficiency. What an idea in 2015. Okay. 
life according to nature. This guy was green way before there was green. Now lack of shame, now that one's a little trickier, but we'll get to that. And then contempt for the social organization. So you might say, well, was Diogenes an anarchist or a, you know, a communist? So the odd part was, he wasn't a hoarder. In fact, he was far from it, uh, as I'll explain in a minute. And he also didn't reject society. He daily went into the, to the Greek marketplace and he philosophized. He became quite famous. Okay? So the reason we call it Diogenes Syndrome was because of the way he lived. He lived in a barrel his entire life. He lived outside in a barrel. And he urinated and defecated outside because he had no shame. He begged. He had lots of forbidden habits. Some people think he's the guy that invented the middle finger because he used it quite a bit. It's said that he urinated on Plato's carpet. Alexander the Great journeyed to see him and ask his opinion. And when he stood in front of him, he said, is there anything I can do for you, Diogenes? And Diogenes said, yes. You're in my son. Don't shade me anymore. Move aside. So utter contempt for authority. So the reason we go with Diogenes is because of the way he lived. All right? So we've got some subtypes here. This is the Canadian folk. Primary and secondary. I think these are just further subclassifications. Primary is, you know, this is very much with folks that have capacity and it's intentional and we can't find any, any frank axis one or axis two disorders. And then secondary, this is clearly comorbid, related to mental illness. Some interesting demographics. It's an equal opportunity disease, though some later case studies indicate more females than men, but it, it probably has to do with what they hoard. Females tend to hoard animals, men, tools, books, things like that. It can occur in younger patients, but for the most part, this is a disease of the elderly, average age, you can see it up there. It's not particularly rare, if you look at the numbers. But it's clearly hidden, underreported. This is below the radar. These people aren't going to come forward. And because most of them are alone, no families coming. Most of them don't even have families, never have families. And then, you know, there's something called Diogenes Avia, that's a hoarding of the homeless. You know, I'll never forget three years ago, my wife and I were in Palo Alto, California. What an affluent city that is. I mean, it's super affluent. We're just walking down this very fancy street, and here's this guy pushing up. Uh, grocery cart, and it's filled, must have been 17, 18 feet in diameter, I don't know where he got this monstrous plastic bag, with plastic bottles, filled with them, and, and he's just kind of walking down the street in beautiful Palo Alto. Or Diogenes Dios, the religious hermits that hoard, if you will. We think there's risk factors, and you might say that makes a lot of sense. Certainly, if folks have cognitive impairment, they, they may be more likely to be uh, at risk for DS. Certainly, personality disorder, if we're able to get longitudinal history or collateral history, and that's such a difficult thing to backpedal with for somebody who's in their 70s. Depression, living alone, low income, and then even some some medical pieces, maybe more risk with the hip fracture, maybe that reduces mobility, more risk with the stroke, maybe there's some hidden or not so hidden cognitive pieces to post-stroke folks. And then we get to treat. Holy cow, what do we do? These are ethical dilemmas, okay? At what point do we as society or we as an individual helping agency intervene. When is too much too much? Should we have intervened in Imelda Marcos's 10,000 pairs of shoes? No, she wasn't a hoarder, she was a collector. <laughs> it didn't impair her life, okay? 
And then, you know, I, I don't know about your Ten Commandments, but my Ten Commandments, two of them are, you know, number one is patient autonomy. Whenever possible, they should participate in the decision-making towards their health care. And number two is beneficence. Whatever it is I suggest we do, it should be toward their good. What if patients don't agree with either of those? And you already get the feeling these folks won't. Okay. And then, you know, question three. This is a conundrum of sorts. If they're mentally competent, do you have the right to neglect yourselves? Well, I, I know plenty of people, friends, neighbors, that have some degree of neglect. I won't say it has to do with self-neglect or squalor, but some degree of neglect. One might even say, I have some neglect in some domain or area of my life. So when do we say it's okay for society inter to intervene or helping agencies to intervene? Where's that threshold, that line? Okay. So one principle here that you probably already picked up from case one. Remember Mrs. Flabeats that had a good ending? There was sort of this collaborative, slowly evolving, gentle plan and care by consent. But that means you got to do a lot, a lot of labor. This isn't the quick fix. And our society loves the quick fix. You don't have any money, go to the ATM. You're hungry, drive through, get some food. You don't feel well, take a pill. We want the quick fix. We don't want the long, hard road. Why are you smiling? <laughs> the truth hurts, eh? So, treatment. Well, I, I kind of like this piece because I, I never heard the word until a few years ago, the geriatric giants. So do you know the geriatric giants? They're those big syndromal issues like cognitive impairment, falls, incontinence, immobility, dizziness, and malnutrition. You know, they're big areas that you can't just lock into one kind of disease state. And they just cause so much suffering and trouble. Okay, so one view is to look at Diogenes syndrome, kind of like we look at geri the geriatric giants, meaning there's not going to be one specialist or one subspecialty that's going to fix this. This is going to be a collaborative, comprehensive care team approach. So in a perfect world, like the VA, this is a perfect <laughs> world. You don't have to worry a terrible much about cost or prior authorization, or maybe I'm delusional. I don't know. Okay, but in a perfect world, unlimited resources, unlimited time, unlimited help. Okay, this is what we'd like to do for somebody with Diogenes syndrome. You know, self-neglect, horrible squalor, lack of shame. Okay, hoarding rubbish, excessive. Well, we want to do the history, medical, psychiatric. We want to reconcile medicine, but probably very few, quite honestly. We want to really look at their function. Can they see, hear, swallow, do ADLs? How mobile are they? How continent are they? Social history. Boy, that, that to me, if, if there's anything, that would be where the money is, and that's where you're all so much better skilled and versed than I am. And then, you know, again, unlimited resources, let's test them. I bet if we do really careful neuropsychological testing, we'll find something. Okay. And, you know, we don't want to invade these people, so we don't want to gang up on them. But, again, perfect world, you know, maybe have OT come in. They'll do cognitive testing. How interesting. And, you know, if they're looking like they... They're very well fed, call up the dietitian, nutritional arm. Social work, they're going to be the coordinators. They'll be the captains of the team. And then if need be, they can see the geriatric internal medicine guru or the geriatric psychiatry guru, and we'll see how it goes. But what we want to avoid is invasion. Think of the second case. Because they'll come back stronger, more resistant, they'll reacquire it, it'll be worse, and they'll be far less likely to even open the door a peep, and they'll be suspicious and paranoid to beat the band, and all will go terribly poorly.
poorly. And there's even some evidence that when these folks are plucked out of their environment and institutionalized against their will, things don't go well at all. Some evidence. So you say, well, well holy cow, what do we do? Back to our good friends up north, the Canadians. They've developed a very interesting model. It's called a gatekeeper model. So this is clever. They train non-traditional folks for seniors at risk. Like who? I love the first one. Letter carriers. Letter carriers. Number two, pharmacists. Okay. So really, people that are, have contact with folks to a degree. And you know, these are the folks that kind of, they're the, the scouts, if you will, and the gatekeepers, they're going to do the things you know so well, assess, diagnose, manage, follow up. Boy, that's, that's the key for these folks. And they don't hospitalize it. This is all done outpatient, 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 daycare, community care. So lovely. What about medicine? So I'm a psychiatrist, so I should talk for hours and hours on end about medicine. Well, not much. You know, there's uh, some evidence with some SSRIs, particularly Paxil, Paroxetine, in obsessive compulsive disorder that, that maybe in high doses these medicines dampen or reduce obsessive thinking, dampen or, re or reduce compulsive behavior. There's a kind of a European import that, that may or may not be on the AMVA formula here called anaphrenol, clomipramine. There's some evidence that that's helpful in obsessive compulsive disorder. But this isn't obsessive compulsive disorder per se. This is more and less of obsessive compulsive disorder. And then, of course, we have the, this is the era of the, the, maybe the rise and perhaps the fall of atypical antipsychotics. And, and they, they have their place in managing you know, uh, psychotic symptomatology in the elderly. And then, of course, home safety. You know, we've learned a lot about home safety from, you know, childproofing the demented patient's home. You know, trying to make it as fallproof, as safe as possible. You know, this, this is more than that. This is decluttering to the extreme and then keeping it decluttered and, uh, and organizing. Um, but again, these folks can undo things pretty quickly. So, so what do we have here? Some, some conclusions, right? So one, one thought is that perhaps depression, dementia, and I think I neglected to, to put substance as a risk factor per se, they're, they're woven into this, but they're not, uh, you know, leading edge kind of things. Certainly, you know, think about dementing illness, particularly frontal lobe syndrome, uh, where, where people lose judgment in a, in a dramatic way. It is now a formal DSM-5 diagnosis. There's the, the epidemiology, if you will. This is in 60 to 90-year-olds. year, old, 90 year old. Look at that piece. When you test them, they typically have high IQs, above average IQs, and they've held you know, semi-professional jobs and have successful work histories, but usually work histories where they work alone very few, if any, relationships in their lifetime. You know, some people say, is Diogenes syndrome kind of the final common pathway of maybe a personality disorder with a smidgen of cognitive impairment and a, and a, a you know, a whiff of paranoia worked into it? So, uh, you know, here's the, the refrain to that, you know, so these folks have always been compulsive. Maybe it's served them well in their semi-professional job. Maybe they've been paranoid to a degree, but as time has passed, it's, it's escalated slowly but surely. And then they have no one to kind of reality test for. Okay? No relationships. I mean, you think when I think about Diogenes syndrome, you know, why do they have all these cats? Maybe that's a relationship of sorts. Why do they have all those books? Books are my friends, okay? 
And uh, you know, then then number seven is is the one that's that's just the challenge for us, isn't it? This is this is you know, you say, oh, this is so hard. I, I need to go into another line of work. You know, work as a barista at Starbucks because people refuse my help. You know, this is such a difficult field. This persistent refusal of help, that baffling mystery. You know? how, so how do you engage them, that motivational interviewing that we're learning about? How do you, how do you get a little, a wee bit of rapport? Okay. And then, of course, you know, we kind of have to do this because sometimes the public health is in jeopardy. Certainly the patient's health may be in grave jeopardy. And, you know, maybe all heck will break loose and they'll burn the, their house and their neighbor's house down to the ground. So a story, a true story. And this is circa 1947, not that long ago. Four-story brownstone in New York City owned by a pair of twin brothers, Homer and Langley Collier, C-O-L-L-Y-E-F. Look it up tonight, because it's incredible reading. So they get this phone call to the New York City Police Department. The phone call is a tip. Somebody's died in the house. They dispatch the police. They then dispatch the fire department, because it takes 14 hours to get into the brownstone. They send out one police officer. It takes him 10 hours to find a body of Langley Collier. And he's dead underneath a trash tunnel. They ex they, over a period of months, they excavate 180 tons of rubbish from this four-story brownstone. But it's a sensational story in 1947, because they can't find the other brother and they think he killed his brother and took off and then out of grief or remorse called in this tip. But lo and behold, two weeks into excavating the 180 tons of rubbish, they find brother number two. He's dead of a heart attack. He's 10 feet away from his brother, buried in newspapers. So you say, oh, Dr. Weiss, you're such a storyteller. <laughs> Next time you go to New York City, so go see the Statue of Liberty. Go see, of course, Freedom Tower. You've got to see that. Go to a Broadway play. And then I want you to go to Collier Park. Because they raised the building, and they put a beautiful, lovely green space there. And then they've got a little, little memorial to the brothers. Okay? So that's sort of at the epicenter of hoarding, Langley and uh, Homer Collier. Prognosis is poor, management is challenging, non-compliance with treatment and follow-up are common. So if you say, you know, I've, I've mastered my job now and I feel like a, you know, a, a Jedi Knight and you want to take on a, a new challenge, take on this one. So, I think I'm done, but hold on. What? Why do people hoard? So you said it a minute ago, the lady in lovely turquoise. You said, those are valuable to that person. Okay? And, and you know, I, I suspect all of us, to some degree, collect or hoard something. Okay? And it may not be understandable to our partners or our family or to others. Usually it's sentimental things. Okay? It's a, or a source of security. Maybe we're worried that if we forget or lose items, then we're going to look bad. Okay? Maybe it's something that started out a long time ago and grew out of hand. Okay? Maybe number four is, is becoming more important in our era of hacking and, and your whole life is on a little chip. Okay? Um, so why do people hoard? Well, Another reason that we hoard and another reason we obsess is because it has survival value. There are 70 species of animals that hoard. Think of our famous pack rat. Think of our squirrel storing up nuts for the winter. It has a survival piece to it. Survival piece to obsessive stuff because if you avoid things that are disease-laden and contaminated, 
you'll live longer back in the old days. Okay? The pox, if you will. So there's some survival value to it. So on that note, we'll, we will take a handful of questions because I want to finish early. <laughs> or observations. Way in the back. You know what? I looked it up. I mean, it is incredible. I, you know, so what you're saying is absolutely true. The call in your house didn't live there. It's actually a book by E. L. Doctorow, who's a phenomenal writer, and the title is Homer and Langley. And uh, that'll really give you if, you, if you get a tickle out of that, you'll, you'll like E. L. Doctorow. He, plus, he's such a stand-up writer kind of guy. Ah, I knew you'd be worn down to the night. <laughs> this is perfect. <laughs> about that uh, show they have on, on the television, uh, show they have on television, Borders Buried Alive. Have yeah. you ever seen that? I, I've never oh. seen it. I think there's other there's other reality TV shows. I mean, what what isn't a reality TV show? Now? And, and somebody told me, and I don't know this, I'm ashamed to say, there's a wonderful Disney film uh, about a mermaid. What's it called? The Little Mermaid. Little Mermaid. So, there's a character there called Ariel who collects yeah. and hoards human objects. Is that right? No. <laughs> I never heard of it. <laughs> but you're right, there's, there's more than one reality TV show, and that one sounds particularly dramatic. What's it called? Buried in Trash? Borders Buried Alive. Buried Alive. Right. Yeah. They, they I, usually, I've not seen it, so. They usually have um, one episode. And I confess I have watched a couple of episodes. So, um, maybe well, come two, on, confess. Yeah, <laughs> about two, maybe two different cases, case studies, and and they show um, intervention, um, family, uh, social worker, uh, case worker, and uh, and then a professional like, organizer or um, person to help them to, to agree to let go of the items and to clean out. And, and it's very dramatic. And I always wonder, um, they show uh, at, the, at the end, and they're not always good outcomes, like you showed in your example. Sometimes it's, it's, it's very nice and the person is able to let go. You know, they, they get to the root of why they started the hoarding, and other times it, it, it's just not quite there yet. But, but I was wondering how, um, if the prognosis is not that great, the ones they show like at the end, it's about six months or so, they show them with a good outcome, yeah. do they continue to get follow-up and to keep them on that track? I, I don't know the answer to that question, and, and I really like your your lovely description because you kind of reinforce that that team collaboration, and and then you said something that really caught my ear. They bring in a professional organizer. So here's another little factoid that'll blow your mind. The net, and I know that I'm kind of worried about this lady in the back because she's going to check out everything I'm saying. So, the, the National Association of Professional Organizers, also known as NAPO, they have 40,000 members. So, you know, if you're looking at like a career transition, you know, I don't know if they have a training program, but there are professional organizers and not a handful. There's a lot of them. Yes, Joe. Hi, boys. I wanted to ask you, is the Diogenes uh, syndrome pretty common in only certain geographical areas? Ooh. And, and again, I, I don't know the answer to that. You know, is this, is this a disorder more of a first world mm -hmm. uh, nation or an industrialized nation where we have a lot of things to hoard? I mean, my, my hunch, my guess would be yes. You know, right now I'm, I'm interested We've got research projects at our place in binge eating disorder. And of course, that's not a diagnosis in third world countries. In fact, it's the opposite. You know, you know, we live in a time now on this planet where there are two huge epidemics that are just raging. So an epidemic of obesity and an epidemic of starvation. I mean, how, how paradoxical is that? So my, I don't know, I don't know about data in other countries, but, and it would be fascinating, other first world countries, Europe, Japan, and so forth. All I got to tell you is, is mostly the Canadian experience. What do you think? What, what's your hunch? I would 
think um, it, is, it will become mostly in the European, uh, European, maybe even North American, uh, Canada, yeah. and North Canada, You know, it's a disease of, of the elderly, and, and of course in third world countries, people don't live as long as they do in first world countries. So. But I, I don't know the answer. Did you check the National Association of Professional Organizations? No, Dr. Wise. But what I did was interested in, and I promise to by that, that uh, question, because I was interested in Stratus and just different, um, you know, all peoples, you know, is there, a, right. is there a group that it yeah. might occur more frequently in, right. or it's not a respecter of persons like dementia? And, and the impression I got, and, and again, I'm just a, a junior, junior apprentice here, is that, that it looks like these folks, for the most part, are, are better educated. And, and maybe you know, above average or average in, in kind of the, what is it, the SES, the social economic stratification? That was the impression I got. But, you know, we just got the tip of the iceberg, because this isn't something that's, you know, dramatically studied. Pretty recent. Our information is from Canada. How often do you see that? Jeez. So, for those of you working on your dissertation, or you're wondering about a dissertation project or a PhD thing, here you go. You can just go wild because we don't have a lot of info on it. So this is thought provoking. Are there any other questions that I cannot answer? <laughs> so far, that's what I'm doing. It's a brilliant job. Maybe I could be a politician. This is great. Yes, sir. Same question that is, is there a, 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 a most is there a history of these people uh, having uh, you know coming from humble beginnings and, and that's still part of their survival te te you know technique that they're, that they're boarding and it's coming back they're going back to this and the other question is do, do you have that on whether it's in, boarding is increasing decreasing or do we know? Uh, I, I I, I have a hunch about the first part because we've got some data since hoarding disorder was included in DSM-5. The, the thinking is that this, these behaviors probably started when folks were young but didn't result in impairment until their fourth or fifth decade. And of course you wonder about why that might be. I mean, maybe, maybe it didn't become impairing because, you know, they were collecting slash hoarding when they were young and their parents and their family members said get rid of the 5,000 comic books and 10,000 baseball cards in the basement to which I wish I kept them now because I'd be yeah. retired as a multi-millionaire. Um, now is it increasing, decreasing, or staying the same? Again, this is, this is a, you know, an under the radar psychiatric diagnosis that I don't think we, we track because it's, what, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? It's not as dramatic or as significant as bipolar illness or schizophrenia. You know, this is kind of an end stage disease. Uh, so I, I, I don't know. But what's your hunch? Do you think it's increasing, decreasing, or? I don't know if it's increasing or decreasing, but I guess it's more like uh, other elements, you know, the, the, the ability to, to identify them is probably getting better. Yeah. You know? And, and I know for me being a social worker, the emergency department is like, well, the people that brought him in said that he's, that they couldn't even get into the house. Right. You yeah. know, so you got to make an APS call and you got to get this ball rolling, you know. You know, that's who I should have up here helping me. In fact, they should be talking more than I should, which would be APS. Do we have anybody here from APS? Or? Yeah. Help, help. <laughs> any any uh, observations? Well, it's funny because both of us were just kind of, not 
not giggling during the presentation, but we can definitely relate to all of this because I have three clients currently that I'm working with on a working situation, and I actually work the rural area, and so um, it's pretty prevalent out there. Um, and to top it off, they have typically large spaces um, to work with, which means there's just more and more stuff to just hoard. So basically, with, with our approach, we always go by least restrictive means, which means we try to get our clients involved in the case planning, trying to get friends, neighbors, family, anybody that is willing to, to assist with the, you know, the planning and cleaning and you know, all of that. So it's, it's a constant um, battle that we, <laughs> that we see all the time. And then there's also the questions of, you know, what's the person lack capacity? We have, um, you know, we contract with physicians that go out there to the homes and they can actually do a capacity assessment and give us a better determination. But again, you know, by going by least restrictive, it's never a quick, let's remove this person from their home and, you know, put them in a nursing home or anything like that. That's, that's not really our approach, which seems to be the reputation that we have when we go out to clients' homes and they're saying, no, I don't want to let you in because you're going to you're gonna take me away and you're going to put me in a nursing home or something, which is not the case. So, um, but yeah, we, we try to take the, the approach of at least getting our clients involved in the case planning as much as possible and definitely trying to get as many resources um, to assist with the project as possible. And if they're available, again, in the rule, it's, it's really difficult sometimes to, to even get anybody to go out there to help. <laughs> Wow, th thank you. That, that was just fantastic. Yeah, I had a question, and that was, have you found any correlation? You, you made a comment about it being a, uh, there, there being a component of survival. Have you made any, or has there been any correlation with uh, those who went through the Great Depression or whose parents went through the Great Depression? Ooh, yeah. Because that's one that, that I found that is possible. Or it may just be this generation, yeah. but um, you know, you say you say that it started. I find that a lot of military uh, people, especially that were overseas a lot, they'll they'll hoard things that you would just not even think to hoard. But it, but the purpose of it is because they still remember when they couldn't get something like tin foil yeah. overseas. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if there's any kind of component like that in it. Oh, I, I think that, that you're very insightful. You know, both of my folks went through the Great Depression, and then they were German on top of it. So, you know, it's a double whammy. Um, we saved everything. You know? I mean, you never knew if you might well, need it. Well, they were taught that. Right. right. That, that and it was survival. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like a lot of disease states. There's kind of a you know, a, a germ of truth to it, there's an adaptability to it. But then, like a lot of disease states, it's either too much or too little. And in this case, it's too much. But, you know, I, I bet you're right. An awful lot of folks uh, probably were either survivors, although there's very few now of the Great Depression, getting fewer every day, or family members and, and their they, they may have been very young when it Yeah, when they happened. adopted they this kind young. of frugal, uh, pack rat mentality, and then as they got older, some cognitive impairment, yeah. more paranoia, more isolation, it kind of took on a life of its own. Exactly. But what a, what a great insight. Fabulous. I have some insight on what she just said. I've done home health nursing. And uh, I guess we have about 30 patients in a week, six a day, five days a week. I can always find at least three or four of us. At least. Now, you're lucky if it's only foil. Well, no, that's and just it's one of them. That was the one example. And that's it's never just one, one of the things <laughs> from the depression. And one of my friend's mother hoards tissue paper, wrapping tissue paper, and she actually reuses it, which is good. She doesn't totally afford it. But there is an amazing amount of people out there that afford things. Uh, teachers are horrible. They have the papers that they wrote. They have the papers that their kids in, in school wrote, the papers that their own kids wrote. The boxes and boxes and boxes of papers. You go into their home and you're trying to do their care and you just kind of have to rummage around boxes and whatever. 
to do their care. But there are, out of 30 patients a week, and maybe not 30 patients, because sometimes I would have the same six patients a whole week. I would always have three. Mm -hmm. So three out of six is a lot. Yeah. You know, that is a lot of orders. And a lot of it has to do with depression, because they're older people, they live through it in some form, they, you know, they've been there, they, they need, have the need. And of course, as you get older, your income is fixed. You don't have all the money in the world, so you need to save on some things and afford things. So maybe uh, what you would add to this presentation is that folks with Diogenes syndrome uh, are kind of at the they're the worst of the orders because of the mm -hmm. self neglect and the, the squalor. These folks, it sounds like you're seeing them as an outpatient. They're pretty functional, yeah. but they they That's have fifty percent that don't have a psychiatric problem. Right. Right. They have a physical need. They have a physical need. You know. So, so maybe maybe what this little piece is about is is way more questions yeah. than answers, mm -hmm. and that's always a good thing, isn't it? When when you're kind of left just thinking about things, way more questions. And all the memories. So a rainy afternoon. Blast that. Swingy Holland too. Oh, wait, here's where you get to watch. Motor trips, and burning visual. lips, burning toast and prune. Thanks for the memory of candlelight and wine, castles on the Rhine.